Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Hello, thank you, Tim, for that intro. You're welcome. You're listening to KABF in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm Carrie McCoy, and like Tim said, it's time for me to get up in your business. If you're just tuning in for the first time, let me explain what the next hour will be like. Think of it as continuing your education. According to the United States Census Bureau in 2009, which is seven-year-old data, the average American spends 100 hours a year in their car. Add that up over a lifetime, and you've spent years driving in your car, like three or five years driving in your car. If you're in Arkansas and you do a big commute, you probably spend five years of your life driving in your car. That's like a college education. So this got me thinking, and in September of this year, with the help of John Kane at KABF, I started this show, Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, the mission to turn your drive time into learning time for small business owners or for those who dream of owning a small business. I use this platform to share my business knowledge and wisdom with you. Our listeners, while you multitask at driving or cleaning your house or doing homework, you can learn. You may be even asking yourself, what makes this lady qualified to give me mentoring advice? And I'll tell you, experience. 40 years ago, with just $400, I started Arkansas Flag and Banner. Since then, it's morphed into simply flagandbanner.com with sales nearing $4 million. That's worth saying again. I started Arkansas Flag and Banner with $400, and today we have sales nearing $4 million. I started by selling flags door-to-door, then went to telemarketing, next mail order and catalog sales, and today we rely heavily on the Internet. In addition, over the last 40 years, I've navigated Flag and Banner through two recessions and two wars. I hope I don't ever have to do it again. When people find out I'm that woman who owns Arkansas Flag and Banner, they often say, oh, I've heard about you, and begin asking me business advice. I amaze even myself with all the knowledge I've gained. Four decades ago, when I started Arkansas Flag and Banner, I supplemented my income while waitressing, all while I peddled my flags door to door after nine years. Did you hear me? Nine years of working a part-time job, the company began to grow and solely support me. My first hire was a bookkeeper to handle the clerical side of the business. My first expansion was to begin the manufacturing of custom flags. So a sewing department developed. The next decade ushered in the Desert Storm War. Flags were scarce, so a screen printing department was hurriedly built to meet consumer demands. In addition to sales and manufacturing, Flag and Banner now has a purchasing department, a shipping department, technology department, marketing department, call center, and retail store. And I spearheaded the development of every one of these departments. Now, this is when I usually introduce my guest, isn't it, Tim? That is correct. Who is usually another fellow entrepreneur, and we talk candidly. We share our stories, our business experiences, our lessons learned, And we do this through curious conversation and storytelling. I call it reality radio because it's live and uncensored. But because today's a holiday, it's going to be a little different. Rather than interrupt our fellow entrepreneurs on this holiday weekend with an appearance on our show, we're going to air excerpts from previous shows. Tim and I picked two pre-recorded interviews edited each of them down to about 20 or 25 minutes, and presto, we have today's show. Our choices are Barry Corcoran's interview. He is a financial planner who gives advice on what he deems best practices for retiring and succession of your business. And the other is Matt McLeod's interview, when he took a leap of faith and turned his passion into his business and opened McLeod Fine Arts Gallery. Before we get started with our two awesome condensed interviews. I want to introduce my technician and the person you've been hearing, my partner in crime, Mr. Tim Bowen. Hello. Okay, let's get started, Tim. All right. Who do you want to start with? Who is our first one? Let's do Barry Corcoran. All right. Barry is the founder of Barry M. Corcoran and Company. His company and his life's work has been to help clients execute and make informed decisions about their retirement and their family legacies. 
Barry also advises in fiduciary audits and when needed gives expert testimonies under oath in a courtroom. That seems scary. So he's pretty much the real deal. Yeah. In 1983, he received his CFP, I love all these acronyms they have, Certified Financial Planner designation. In 2003, from the University of Pittsburgh, he received his AIFA designation, Accredited Investment Fiduciary Auditor, making him the first and sole AIFA person in the state of Arkansas. Barry is the founding president of the Arkansas Chapter of Financial Planning Association, where in 2004 he was presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Money Magazine designated Barry Corcoran one of the best 200 financial planners in the United States. Nationally recognized again, Bloomberg's Wealth Manager Magazine ranked Barry's firm 54th in the list of top wealth managers in the United States. He once was his own host of his very own radio show, Ask the Experts, on KARM. Now he is a recurring expert on THV11's morning show in Little Rock, Arkansas. And last but not least, Barry co-authored his book, Widowed, beginning again personally and financially, and he pulled from his own experiences with widows to write this book. He published it in 1999. Profits from the sale of this book are donated to nonprofit organizations that assist widows. This was a hard hour to cut down to 20 minutes because we talked about everything. But we did it. And for you to hear now, we have it for you. Thank right. you. Barry Here's Corcoran. Barry Corcoran. So I asked you on today because I got an email from a listener and I quote, Can you speak, she asked, can you speak to the issues around multi generational businesses and succession issues? Before we get to the listener's questions, I want you to tell us about yourself. What are you doing right now, and what is your current passion? Oh wow! Um, well, my, catch you off guard. Yeah, uh, just a, just a little bit. You know, um, having been in this business for decades, we established plans and strategies with families, and my practice is maturing to the point where I'm seeing those plans actually be executed and come into play, and we're seeing wealth and opportunity move to the next generation. And so, for me, that's very exciting to set up uh, an estate plan or a trust 20 years ago and to see it actually do what it's supposed to do and to do it very effectively. How'd you do? Did you do good? Uh, uh, Well, sure. We did very well. Sounds like you did. Top 10 in the (laughs) top 54th in the country. Yeah. So so I I think that for financial advisors to get to the point where your your practice is maturing and you're working with the the children of the second generation, And having a voice to the third generation, their children, of the wealth that mom and dad put together is is very, very interesting, very rewarding work. I bet. So, Barry, you're a small business owner. You started this business. And you also help small business owners like me. So to speak to our listeners' question, let's say you're ready to start thinking about your exit strategy for you in your business. And I think your three choices are these, and you may have more. Pass it on to a family member. Or you could pass it on to your employees, ESOP. I love that. Mm -hmm. Sell it, figuring out what the value of it is, or dissolving it. Where do you want to begin on that topic? Which one? Well, uh, you know, it's obviously a very personal uh, family decision uh, about whether, you know, I guess the first discussion is, are we going to pass it on to the kids? And so when your kids are five or six years old, kind of hard for you to imagine them uh, even being interested or wanting to be involved in your business at all. And um, so as your children get older and they uh, develop their own interest and and their goals and and what they want to do, it's not uncommon for the children not to do what mom or dad did. Uh, And so it it takes a while for a business owner to determine that there's not going to be a family member who's a good candidate to step into their shoes when when they retire. So you say there usually is a child that wants to go Quite. into the business or there usually isn't? There usually isn't it. Is is not. Yeah. It's 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 I think more often the case that the the children just develop other interests and other passions that is not to sell flags or give financial advice or whatever the business is and and or that maybe they're not as skilled or equipped to run the business uh, that was started by the previous generation. So it's it's a uh, it's not uncommon at all, and, and it forces the business owner into one of the other uh, alternatives. But the the first evaluation is: Do I have anybody in the family who's going to do this? And you don't know. 
and you don't know. And, and, and it's uh, almost like you don't know until it's too late because you don't know until they get through high school and college or tech school and, and get their education and, and, and kind of get that youth part behind them and then begin to kind of think about what they want to do with their lives. And so they might be, for me, it took a long time. So I went to you yeah. when my kids were young, remember? Yep, right. and, I and, do. And uh, you helped me do a very extensive uh, plan about succession of my children and then yeah. we had to redo it again yeah how often do so, you have so to at, revisit yeah. so, so at the time in, in your case uh, w- when we looked at that your, your kids were really young yes. and, and we really couldn't uh, assess their ability to run your business or their desire to run their, their business and so it was about how do we capture that economic value of what you have built and then and then pass that along to them because the presumption was that they weren't, and we didn't know whether they were going to take on the business. And so, you know, when when your kids get older, you begin to kind of sense or feel they're not going to be candidates or they are. So, so yes, when it, do you bring them in to, and ask them? When well, do you bring them all oh, in and no, say? The par- no, the parents, you know. You uh, don't ask them. Well, you just need to review this every few years, and here's our plan. And, you know, gee, how do you feel about your son and daughter and their skill or ability or interest in running your business? And if the answer is, I'm not feeling it, then it's not going to work out. And I think that's a little bit of the problem because it takes a parent a number of years. I think maybe if I just kind of give it another year or so, my son or my daughter is going to be a good candidate, and then, you know, maybe it still doesn't work out. So then you find yourself, gee, here we are. My my kids are in their 30s, and I'm in my 60s, and, you know, kind of behind the curve to make a decision here. How do you transfer the business and then we'll move on to selling it or dissolving it. So your kids do want your business. That's that, and that's probably the most complicated of all the options. Because oh. selling it is, is a, a different path and um, that's actually easier than integrating the, you know, the children. Okay, then and, we'll and, start. And, mm-hmm. and probably the biggest problem with uh, having the kids step into the shoes uh, of the uh, of the of the member who, who started the business is the member lingers and stays on. Yeah, and and the loyalty that the employee has to the company, but I've worked for this person for forty years, and now this young whippersnapper is coming yeah. in here, and and it's just it, it's just a different, very difficult uh, um, trans- so, transition for employees to make. So what we did, and I'll just share. I don't think it matters. Sure, uh, we did a board, yep. so that if I pass, Arkansas Flag and Banner goes into a trust. There was a board of three. Correct. On Arkansas flag and banner, and one was you, of course. Of course, you're my age; you may die yeah. too. Yeah. And then the other one was a family member that rotated on and off every year, so a right. new family member. Right. And then, and then we had just a uh, like a uh, a professional, a, right. a bank trustee. So, or yeah. Somebody. So, so, so let's kind of go back to that. You know, when you're talking about small business, that could either be a sole proprietorship, it, it might be a partnership, or it might be a limited liability company, it might might be a corporation. Right. So there's there's legal issues about how you treat uh, you know all of those. In small business with small business owners, there's not a board of directors, and the idea that you adopt a board of directors even though you're the only person running the company. But that's what you do. Yeah, that's exactly what you should do, is, is that you should have a kind of a quasi-board of directors or a real board of directors that that help guide that business to, you know, down one path or the other. And and so in the absence of, of the business owner, who is has all the experience and knowledge to, you know, to do that, and, and you lose that person, the board of directors steps in, and they guide the business, and it doesn't necessarily trigger the sale of the business because because the business owner has passed away. It just says that this committee of three people are going to be good stewards of the business, whether they keep it and then nurture it to see if one family member steps into those shoes or whether you sell it or some other transition. But the whole idea is to capture the value of the business. So it doesn't degrade or decline in value. That so that you can sell if you want to after you're gone. That's so one of the options. here, here's me. I don't ever want to sell my business. Probably. I mean, I might. I don't know. But right now, I don't think I'm going to sell my business. You, and will, I you, you will never sell your business. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> and I'll never retire, will I? No, you'll never retire. <laughs> no. So I'll be sitting at the desk, and all of a sudden, one day, I will have a heart attack, and they'll find me in there with my cup of coffee, and they'll come to you. 
and they'll say, Mom is gone. What is she? What did she have in place? And you will say, uh, we now have to start a board. There's Arkansas a board. Flag and Banner will now be run by a board and no longer by Carrie McCoy. And these are the board members. And y'all get together, and I'll facilitate and uh, we'll make decisions as a group. And if you all want to sell it, we'll sell it. If you all want to grow it, we'll grow it. If y'all all want to work in it, you can work in it. And it becomes their decision on what they want to do with their life and the business that I left them. Yeah, that, that board of directors, or, it, or, or in some cases the, a, a trustee committee, actually has the primary objective of stabilizing the business that's you. Uh, You're saying no. that's you? Well, no, that's... No, the, the whole the, board. Yeah, the whole board. Okay. And, and so whether it's selling flags or, or you're selling chickens or... Or you have what, a restaurant. Or we have a restaurant. Wh- whatever that business is, is that they are to step in and stabilize and maintain and manage, make sure that there's a good manager and the business is managed well to be profitable and stabilize. It's good for the employees. It's good for you know, whoever gets the, the value of the business. But the whole key to it is is that is that board or that trustee committee needs to have, if they don't have any experience in running a, a, a restaurant, they need to get a third party there that knows how to, 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 to do a, a restaurant. So you need, you need somebody who has keen business sense and, and specific experience with that industry and then somebody who, who has an interest in making good decisions for your kids. So that's why we kind of have three, a committee of three. And even that committee of three could vote, I want to have a committee of five and get two more people they want on there. If Once they, that happens, if, they could say, you know, we're not smart enough. Let's yeah, get a lawyer yeah, and an attorney yeah, on this board with us. Yeah. So in your case, the committee would, would meet. They would get together. And they would evaluate, do we see anybody in the company who would be a good person to promote, to manage the business, and has the skill set? Or we're going to do triage, we're going to hire somebody short-term just to keep daily operations going while we interview a new person to run the business and hire them to do so. Tell me what triage means. Um, Quit using big words on me. <laughs> quick What's triage? It's got to have something with three. Emergency repair or emergency attention. Oh, that's like surgery. Yeah, well, that's what they do in, in the emergency room of hospitals. So, uh, okay, yeah. so or yeah. we hire a triage, triage comes in and but, what, what, so you have and to, stops it, the bleeding and, you, and you shores admit, it you, up. You have to immediately take the steps to keep the business stabilized and moving forward and keep everybody feeling confident and feeling yeah. And as soon as you communicate that to the employees, there's somebody in charge. There is a plan. It's being executed, and it's going to be in our best interest. There's somebody in charge. There is a plan, and it's being executed, and it's going to be in the company's best interest. Yes. Those are awesome. Those are exactly the issues. You said that perfectly. So you really need advice from somebody like you. This is a deep, this is a deep subject. It's very, it gets very complex. It's very, very, very Even for a very simple business, it gets very complex very quickly. Right. So, okay, let's say, let's say you decide you want to dissolve the business. My parents wanted to dissolve their business because, like you said, I didn't want it. And so I had my own thing going. And so they wanted to dissolve their business, and they did it. How do you suggest? I know they did it by inventory reduction. How else? What are your suggestions if you want to start dissolving your business and taking the money out of it? Well, once again, it depends entirely on the kind of business and what the assets are in the business. And it, and for each kind of business, um, there are certain legal uh, issues that need to be addressed, and then there's income tax issues. And so somebody that owns a manufacturing firm um, has a completely different set of uh, dissolution issues or if you're going to dissolve the business uh, as compared to in a consultant or somebody who has a hair salon. Just They're just very, very uh, different businesses. So, so depending on a variety of factors that there's, in some cases, a, a lot to consider. In cases where somebody has a corporation where you retain wealth inside the corporation, the challenge is to get that wealth out of the corporation. You can just stop doing business. And the challenge is if you've got wealth inside the corporation, you left money in there, it's, it's how do I get it out tax efficiently? And so uh, depending on a variety of factors, you develop a strategy that might take a few years actually to unwind that and 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 then be permitted to dissolve the, the, the corporation. So my parents, they just began to cut their expenses. So they went from 
back then you had lines coming in. So they had like four lines coming in. They went down to one line coming in. So they saved money on their telephone bill. Then they began to yeah. save money on their utilities. Then they yeah. began to cut back their payroll. And they began to take the money out over years out of the business. They reduced their inventory. And by the time they finally quit working, there wasn't much left in the business. Right. That's an example of a business that required a slow um, process by which you slow down the business. That's what they did. And you lower the volume of sales and you use various strategies and techniques to get the wealth out of the corporation tax efficiently into their hands. And sometimes that takes two or three years. And what's interesting about that is they couldn't have done it abruptly. They couldn't have said, hey, on December 31st, we're just going to kind of stop doing this and we'll shut it down, uh, give the employees a bonus and and call it a day. Why couldn't Uh, they have done that? Because there has to be a business purpose for you to continue a business and, 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 and deploy some of these strategies and Oh. You know, it, because it was a taxable event to take everything out of the corporation. Because it would have been too heavily of a tax burden if they had just stopped. So then, then you can distribute your assets. You pay off your debts. What's the biggest mistake that most people do when they do this? So they don't think about the tax ramifications? Yes. It's very easy to, to make a misstep in dissolving the company only to be hit, hit with a, a gigantic tax bill a year, a year and a half later because you didn't realize what you were doing. So all your life you've worked and now all of a sudden you've exited not very um, strategically or intelligently, and now all the money you've made, you've had to go to pay the taxes. Your nest egg is scrambled. Your nest egg is scrambled. (laughs) All right, so now you got to get all your papers in order. Are there any special papers at closing your business? It's a a nightmare. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) He's so honest. All right, let's move on to selling it. Now we're going to selling your business. Well, let we didn't me talk let about me, an ESOP where you could pass your business on to your. Yeah. Well, uh, let me let me just speak to somebody who has a business, a sole proprietorship, and they, and they just kind of un, want to unwind it. Okay. All, all of these licenses, you know, for city license and state and payroll taxes and all of these things that we do that are regulations and 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 businesses are required to do, you, you've got to unwind all of that. You've got to send in notices to say I'm not going to be in business anymore. Depending on the business, unwinding it could be extremely complex. What if you just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm dead. I don't care. What would happen? Who could they get? They will find you. They'll find dig you up. Well, they will find you. Well, you can't retire and do that. If you retire, they'll find you. If you just drop dead, it's your kid's problem. Too bad. Well, they just, well, if you drop dead, it's obviously not a problem. But if you're trying to retire and and you just close your business, um, you're going to get letters from the IRS for the rest of your life. And they come knocking on your door. Okay, you're selling it. How do you come up with the value of your company? Because oh. I'm always disappointed in this. <laughs> I always think 42 years, it's uh, got to be worth something. And they come in, they go, $200,000. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, businesses uh, trade uh, based on um, the price agreed to by a willing seller and a willing buyer. So you got to have those two. So <clears> Google <throat> is way overpriced. Or was well, it good? No, it was Yahoo. Which one sold that was way over? Oh, well, it was uh, Facebook. Yeah. Sold way overpriced. Well, but we're talking about a restaurant in North Little Rock. And and so, you know, h- how do I sell that business? And the value of it is, you know, a business owner plays two roles. They're the manager and the owner. The, the owner is getting compensation for making the investment, and the manager is getting compensation for working. Okay? So most of us are both managers and owners, so we're investors and and manage and, and employees. Yeah, and and so the value of the business is really driven to the investor, is really driven by how profitable the business is um, for the for the owner, Be, because so they uh, look at the owner's salary. Uh, they look at the manager's salary and, and how much uh, yeah how much can I can I make in salary or compensation to to run this business and and. Um, you know that's that's a factor in how you value the you know how you value that. And there's a lot of people uh-huh. who who don't make a profit as an owner. They're only making enough money to pay their salary. They're just making salary. Yeah. So that means their business isn't worth as much as they think that it's worth. Well, I have a lot of inventory. What's the what's the what's inventory worth? 
Well, it's not well, worth what I think it's worth. Well, it's, it depends on what the inventory is. It's too. probably aged. It probably has something to do with the age of the inventory. Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on you know a flag that sits in a box for three years looks like the flag that you that's in a box that you got yesterday. So, so it oh, really it's not depends. Perishable, you yeah, mean? Yeah. So it it really depends on what the inventory that that, that we're talking about. But the components of the value of the business are the earnings and. Uh, and the inventory, and do you own the building and the land where your business is? Because you might is. sell the building with it. Yeah, so there, so there's just so a, a you, lot does of your accountant and, and, help and you I, value it? Well, mostly there's some accountants who are uh, eligible or qualified and trained to to uh, appraise businesses, but that's a very expensive process. Very and then I get emails group. all the time from people saying, "Do you want to sell your business? Do you use those people? Do you?" Oh well, those people are intermediaries, you know, looking for deals, How and do, so, yeah. so, so that's. If you're desperate, you use them, uh, get it done quick. Well, you know, I'm very uncomfortable with those people who are out looking for. What if I want to sell to, my business tomorrow? How would I go about it? Probably the best thing to do is go to your competitor. Oh, I see. I mean, because they understand the business, uh, they could use the inventory. Uh, they, they, you know, so you look I, for a syner- synergized partner. Uh, Is yes. that the right way? Yeah, so, somebody who can, you know, who, who, who can appreciate benefit. what, and and maybe you're doing business in a way that's better than theirs. So, and it might be a smaller business or a larger business, but you know, going to a competitor or uh, someone who owns a business that it might be a complement. Uh, uh-huh. Add to, on. To, yeah, to their Increase to their, their business. product line. Yeah, to something that that kind of makes sense, you know, for for their business. So plan before too. we change off the succession subject, yes, and we didn't talk about ESOPs for passing it on to your employees, which I love that one. There's a lot of grocery stores out there that are employee owned, yes. and I love that. Have you ever done one of those? Yes, we we've actually worked with some people. Have done. Are that. they successful uh, very much? Um, yeah, many times they are because m- most of the time um, they're leveraged e So What's that I, mean? That means a bank has to make some loans to uh, to the to the plan to to cash out the owners, uh-huh. and, um, and and so in order to get a bank involved in an ESOP, there's a lot of eyes and 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 uh, and then it has a board it probably. A, yeah, so so in other words, it's vetted. I mean, it goes through a process that if you put in a, a leveraged ESOP, then then there's um, just elements in the plan that that, that lend to its and success. They all, and all the employees pretty much keep their pay. They just kind of get stock. Isn't that right? They just become partial owners. It's like yeah. a stock in the com- in the company. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, they're they're kind of working for themselves, if you will. If I wanted, to, if I did go and sell my business to somebody to a synergized company for me, uh, uh, another flag company, let's say. Would you owner finance it? I had a girlfriend owner finance the sale of her business, and then it went belly up, and she ended up not getting any money. Have you ever seen that, where the owner finances it? Yes. You you don't like it, I can tell. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell by the look on your face. You're not a banker, Carrie. Don't start financing people. Yeah, I mean, if you were selling a land and a building, uh, I mean, it's because well, you, you it's, can go get it back. Every, yeah, because you can get that back. But, but they run your uh, business into the ground, and now you've got it and back, and you got to start all over. And you were trying to retire. Yeah, you know, if the bank's not going to lend the money, then there's not any reason for you to lend the money. So, by and large, I, I'm not real crazy about that. So you idea. know the story of the town cobbler whose children have no shoes? Yes. Do you have a succession plan? <laughs> Since I'm all wrapped up in your life, um, yes, this, I, I'm, I'm listening to this yeah, answer really yeah, closely. Yeah, yes, I do. Oh, so there, there, there's a short-term and a long-term succession plan. I can tell it's private. Wow, he was good, wasn't he? Yeah, that was a good one. He wasn't going to tell me his succession plan, but I'm hoping it's good. Our next interview is Matt McLeod, a highly successful painter, sculptor, and muralist, specializing in fine art for residential, commercial, and public art projects. After graduating from Southern Methodist University, a.k.a. SMU, in 1987, Matt spent a 15-year career in advertising before becoming a full-time artist. In 2015, he opened his very own McLeod Fine Arts Gallery in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. He has a wonderful story of hard work and faith. I hope you enjoy his story as much as I did. And now, my interview with artist, painter, sculptor, and muralist, Matt McLeod. Welcome to the table, accomplished artist and entrepreneur, Matt McLeod. Thanks, Carrie. You're welcome. Matt, you say about yourself, and I quote, I paint energetic color. What does that mean? (laughs) 
Well, I think that every artist is always trying to, at some point in their career, find out really what they're trying to get at with their work. Artwork is a communication with the viewer. And every artist that matures begins to realize that they're trying to say something and they're trying to get at something. And I think in my evolution, what I've been exploring is that I believe that we're all made up of energy. And, you know, I don't know whether that's our spirit or what it is about us as people that are living and walking the earth. But at some point, we all very much are interested in connecting with each other. And the great thing about art form is it's an ongoing process of connection. And so the more I examine that, And the more I sort of tried to boil down the essence of humanity, the more I sort of got in touch with the fact that we're really human beings that have and contain a sense of energy. And so what I'm doing with my paintings is trying to explore that all the time. And I'm trying to essentially look at things that I see around me. Often they're rather mundane things. But if I can take a mundane thing, explore what I believe is the essence of life, and make that subject sublime by communicating the energy that I feel that we all share, then I've really done something. And I'm able to connect with the viewer in that way. So I may have made a big circle on that, but essentially what I'm doing when I try to show energetic color is I use the tools that I have, which are paints, colors, shape making, and to try to communicate the energy that I feel that we all share. So that's, in a sense, energetic That was color. absolutely beautiful. <laughs> well. <laughs> it was. We are okay. all trying to connect with each other. Well, I think so. And art is so subjective mm. and addictive. Mm-hmm. Good. Once you, yeah, good. There's the entrepreneur <laughs> in it. Yeah, that's good for me. Uh, but once you buy one piece of art, whether it's expensive or not expensive, mm-hmm. you put it in your room and you live with it a little bit and you become addicted to more art. Well, I believe that to be true, Carrie. And, and really, you know, the people who live with fine art, you know, unique works of art, know that to be true. And, and the best art is work that you will come back to. Um, that you will want to live with and that makes that speaks to you and you know you can't really put a price you said you know I don't know if we said expensive or not but you know you can't put a price tag on something that makes you feel really wonderful every time you you connect with it it's something that really gets at your core and there are some pictures or rather art that I have on the wall that I never get tired of looking at right that's the the beauty of living with art oh it's nice and when people really start to get in touch with that they just become collectors and yeah, they just, really shouldn't because it's, it's very addictive. I mean, it really is. I love <laughs> no, I, they should because I, it's addictive. <laughs> so when Jeez. did you first know that you had this gift? Or have you? has it just always been there? Mm, well, you know, I don't always look at it as a gift, but I appreciate you saying that because that means that you see it as such. You know, for me, it's. I think artists know that they have to do it. I think there's a little bit of talent. I tell people that, you know, when I teach students, I I say you have to have a little bit of talent and then you have to have a whole lot of work. And, you know, if you put 10% talent and a 90% work ethic and you work at it really hard every day, you're going to get really good at it. And, you know, I think that's... So it's just practice? Well, there's a part of being able... First of all, you're not going to practice unless you love it. And so there's a response that you're going to have as a visual art form. For me, it's, it's looking at something and recreating it and recreating it in a really interesting way. And I really get a kick out of the viewer that sees something that I've done because essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm looking at something, I take it apart and then reassemble it using my own ability, creative creativity and energy to make something that I hope is even more. And so I love that part, but you have to be in love with it to practice it. So my best answer to you is that it takes a real desire to do it because you kind of really get a kick out of it. But then you have to pile a bunch of hard work around that. Well, that takes me to my next question. Did you study art? No, I didn't. Actually, when I went to school, uh, 83 to 87, I didn't know anybody in Little Rock that was making a living as an artist. And I really went there. I was one of those kids that just didn't know what he wanted to do. You know, I, I thought I would try to get just a general liberal arts education, maybe get a degree in business. And SMU's got those things. And so I went there to originally study business and decided that I kind of fell in love with the communications um, college there and 
got a degree in advertising and thought that I would, in the advertising business, I'd be able to combine both business and creativity. And you can. And so that's what, you know, that's what I ended up getting a degree in. And I really did not study studio art at at SMU. So you had to decide to quit working and getting a regular paycheck Mm -hmm. and to decide, (laughs) look, he's smiling, and to decide to take that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Was there something that triggered that? Yes. And, you know, it was pretty profound in my life. Um, and, and, and you, you talk about leap of faith, and, uh, and that's really what it was. Um, okay, so if I take you back about 15, 16 years ago, I was working for Martin and Melissa Toma. They were my last employer. We went through 9-11 uh, oh. together, and they had a small firm at that time. I was uh, trying to find out what I wanted to do. I was really studying a hobby of painting uh, at that time, and... You know, they were tremendously supportive people and very much about living your dream and finding out what you're really good at and utilizing your talents. And that discussion, that sort of environment made me think about what am I doing and what am I really want to be doing? I guess you sort of hit a point in your, I sort of think of midlife at some point, you know, mid-30s, early 40s, something like that. And you go, what am I doing? What do I really want to be doing? And I knew I was in love with my hobby. And I had a lunch with a guy one time and he said, you know, what are you, what are you really passionate about? And he goes, I go, well, I'm passionate about your, being your account executive. And he goes, okay, well, let's set that aside for a second. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, bullshit. Yeah, bullshit. yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, he smelled it out, and he said, hey, uh, you know, you're, you're a good account executive, but I get the feeling you're really passionate about something else. Don't think about the question. Just tell me right off, what would you really love to be doing right now? And I said, you know, I'd love to be a painter. I'd love to be an artist. I just don't think I can make a living doing it. He said, well, you know, whether you make a living doing it or not, I think you need to give it a shot. You got one life, and, you know, I think you ought to give it a try. And it was, that was profound for me. You know, that was a. I'm See not on your to, Christmas card lift, list well, every no, year? Well, no, as a matter of fact, I lost touch with him, and I need to find out who that what? is, who that was. But, you know, because it was actually profound, and I didn't know it at the time. But I did think it was a, you know, a God moment. I thought it was, I'm, mm-hmm. not, I'm not here to preach any religion. You did go it, to but, Southern Methodist University. Well, I did. <laughs> I did. And, you know, I have my own faith, and I thought that was one of those moments that just didn't come out of. Um, coincidence you know that was right. meaningful yeah you have those moments don't you i do we all do so and, you had and so that was a moment yeah. and then post 9 11 is what, what i'm really trying to get at oh okay and and the economy was terrible i don't yeah. know if you remember that anymore. oh yeah dude the i was selling changed. flags like crazy right. it wasn't terrible well, for me good business for you no no sorry, but it may have been one of the true. only well and i hate to look at it that way but that was the only business probably that i knew of that was you know probably. doing anything most of the people that we were talking to and trying to um either find accounts or servicer accounts were not spending. Right. Everybody was freezing their spending. And we lost uh, one account because they just reviewed it every three years. And the other account was acquired. And then the rest of our accounts that we had on staff weren't spending. So one morning I have this conversation with Martin Toma. He sits down with me and another person says, you know, I just haven't been making, I haven't been drawing a salary for my own business in the last two months. And I just, we have, we're going through a tough time and we're going to have to cut back. We're going to be part, in, and so I'm going to have to lay you off. And the first reaction when you, somebody tells you they're going to lay you off is like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? This is terrible. This is horrible. But I took it another way. I went, you know, Martin, this is a good thing, and I think this is a God moment for me. I mm-hmm. think I'm supposed to go be an artist. And he said, Matt, you'd be a great artist. Mm-hmm. He said, I want to support you. I want you to leave today, and you can go be an artist. And we're going to help you with a, a severance payment to help you do that. And wow. so he's really, they are really wonderful people over there. You know, I almost feel sorry for people who have a really great job and a really great income and a really, everything's really cushy and good, but they are not fulfilled. Yeah, I do too. Because they don't get pushed out into the world to go and find out what their path is and what their passion is and where they should be because it's too soft where they are. Well, I couldn't agree more, Carrie. And, the, you know, the scary thing about it was I had a, a house payment, two car payments, you know, a child, you know, just all the reasons that you have to, you know, be, try to be secure. I, w- I wish all of the people I let go would be that nice when I let them go. And they go, oh, this is really nice. Thank you. But, you know, you said leap of faith, and that's really what it was. And I just thought that these were two very significant signs that I needed to go give it hell and they try. They absolutely you know, were. And mm-hmm. either just fall on my face or die trying, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know that I, I don't know that I had your guts to go sell things door to door, but I, I took that moment and just ran and I just worked every well, your hard, first as hard show, as I could. 
I went to your first show. <laughs> I didn't realize that was your first show. I kind of thought it was when I was there that night. It was in 2006. Right. It was at Local Color mm -hmm. Gallery up on Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was reading that, I thought, you know, I kind of remember that being your first show. Mm -hmm. That has got to be, talk about bearing your soul, mm -hmm. ready to show your work and for people to judge it and to judge you. Mm -hmm. How hard was that? Well, it was really hard. It was scary as hell. I wouldn't kid you to tell that it was anything else. Um, it's just, just absolutely scary. You know, it's like it's like you're holding up your children and you're just hoping that nobody says they hate your baby's ugly, you know. Yeah, you're exposing yourself you to really all are. that criticism. Well, you are, and um, you just have to, you know, you said leap of faith. That's part of it. And part of it is you just have to thicken your skin. And, yeah, this is, you know, this is the way it's going to be. I have to put myself out there. And putting myself out there means that I open myself up for criticism, and, and that's just it. At some point, you have to say to yourself, okay, look, not everybody's going to love me. And they don't. And so you have to focus your attention on the people who do love you. And, there's, right. and, and, and you can start with your family. I think one of the best things to do is to sort of start uh, accounting the people who really love you and care about you. And, you know, I started with my family, my friends, and just anybody that I thought would come and support me in that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you put it out there in the public. And if people don't like you, you know, most of the time what I found is people keep it to themselves and they just don't come. But people who do love you and, and really want to support you will come over and over and over again. And that's, that's the real blessing of it. So, Matt, <laughs> not everyone starts a business about their passion. Right. Talk about opening your gallery and the fears you had to face. I know when you started painting, you probably didn't think I'm going to open a gallery one day because nobody knows, mm -hmm. speaking to Yearn Bob about what y'all are saying about you never know where life's going to lead you. Mm -hmm. You have, have to just do these leaps of faith. You probably didn't ever think, oh, I'm going to start being an artist and then I'm going to open a gallery. No. So I know when you decided to open a gallery, I want to hear why and how you opened it because I know there had to be more sleepless nights. Oh, sure. And there still are. Well, you know, you talked about um, living your passion and once I became an artist, that's really what it was all about. And, and But at some point, you know, I think what we've all been talking about starting off with um, at very modest means and trying to drive your business, at some point you realize I can only make so much money um, doing this. And, you know, it isn't all about money, but at some point, you know, we've been talking about responsibilities and obligations, you know, car payments and electric bills and mortgages and sending kids to college, you know. We, Less stress, the nicer you right, are. Right, you know, and, and but those are very real. And I just thought, well, you know, I really like working with other artists. You know, part of my background in advertising business taught me the business side of things. And I really learned how to uh, be a business person within somebody else's business in that experience. But I understood client relationships. I understood working with the team. I understood working and delivering on deadlines. And I began to see that those experiences led themselves to something that was more than just being simply an artist. And I thought, well, you know, I'd like to combine those two things, both you know, my business skills and my creative skills. And I saw an opportunity to open a gallery. And How did you see an opportunity to open a gallery? Well, I... Like someone just called and said, hey, you want to open a gallery here? No. Um, let me, I'll tell you. I began working with another artist to try to do some public art projects. So I became uh, interested in, in working large. I've always enjoyed painting uh, large canvases. And I began to, to want to be a muralist and, and work on some public projects. And I actually got a meeting with Mayor Stola about some ideas that I had. And at the time, he was look, he's always looking for ways to improve our city, and, and, um, and you know, they can't fund art projects, and that's the really hardest part you know, sure. for the city. They just can't do it. But they need to call the Tourist and Visitor Information Center. They got all kinds of money down there. Well, I'm, don't <laughs> tell everybody I'm working with them right now. <laughs> just a but, tip. But, no, I appreciate that. But, but you're right. It, you know, but they're very interested in seeing uh, creative things happen in, in our city and make the city better. A lot of times they have to go find other uh, funding sources. But, but it's, that's an interesting thing. That's something I learned. But in that process, he said, you know, you ought to go talk to this guy who's bought these buildings over on Main Street because they're looking to create a creative corridor in that area, and we'd love to see some visual arts in that area. And I did. Oh. And I, I met with a guy named Scott Reed. And I don't know if you know Scott or not. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's been kicked around a little bit. You know, he's from Portland, and he bought the buildings over on the 500 block of uh, Main Street. And he's a, actually a decent guy. Mm -hmm. And um, they ran out of money on... Know, different parts of those projects mm -hmm. and that's that's not really what i'm getting at right 
But, you know, one of the things that, that I was a part of that whole conversation, and, and quite honestly, before I get away from that whole topic, I think he's a decent guy. And, oh, yeah. and the people who are trying to build and he's had difficulties with are really great people. It's just, you know, one of those deals where money and finishing the project just didn't didn't work out. We've all had those dead-end streets. And, and that Everybody just, And that has. happens in real estate it, development. It and, happens and so in everything. I don't want to say bad thing about anybody that's part of any of that no but you know part of we that won't con- let you well good well so part of that conversation was that they really i could see that the city and the developers and people who were wanting to really kind of bring main street back uh and revitalize it i uh, wanted to see real creative elements down there and i thought well wow you know i want to be a part of that mm-hmm. because not only i can be an artist um, I can be part of revitalization of Main Street. And this is my Main Street, you know. And so I really, that really resonated with me. So I began just showing up at meetings and I began to contribute. And you landed the mural on 6th and Main Street. I did. And it was part Beautiful. of that same, you know. Does it have a name? Uh, beneath the Surface. Oh. Beneath the Surface. I love it. Thank you. And then you end up looking at it every day because your gallery is right uh, across the street. Fun. Well, you know, I, I, I like looking at it because it's 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 public art, and I love public art. Um, but you know, I love graffiti. I know that's weird. <laughs> I do. Just as long as it's not graffiti over my mural, that's okay. With yeah, me. right. Yeah, that's not. But good. I, but but I think there'd be you know some cool things that we could do with some um, street artists, you know, graffiti artists. That, that if we find a place that really makes sense to do it and do it really well, you know, that could be really fun. I've got a that's wall. That's art from the street, you know. I've and got that's a really wall. It's about well, you know, maybe that's something we'll we could organize. Yeah, thing. absolutely. But, you know, just, just showing up and having conversations with people who are trying to create something really interesting and vital and, and, and uh, you know, creative in, in the city is how I ended up finding space in that building to open a, a gallery and was also able to do a mural across the street. So. That is neat. You got, the, you got the rep on one corner. You got the mural on another corner. And then you've got your gallery on one corner. What's on the fourth corner? Uh, that's really cool. Uh, well, you know, uh, Cranford Company. Oh, yeah. and you got an uh, agency yeah, the, that's your, the, close to your heart the on the Cranford other corner. Cranford Brothers, uh, Wayne Cranford's uh-huh. sons, uh, formed their own marketing communications uh, firm on that corner. But right next to them is Ballet, Arkansas. Oh, that's and right up there with my heart. Yeah, they're moving in, um, hopefully, I saw that sign when I was weeks. down there just last night. I was wondering. Hey, man, you talk about beautiful uh, artists down, and Matt, athletes. Down. Oh, man. Yeah, well, right. The ballerinas are beautiful. But, you know, they're a unique combination of, of, of athletics and, and art form. It's just really cool to see them and have that energy down there. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, the building is going to get finished uh, relatively soon, and hopefully the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra is going to move in next to them. I don't want to speak for them. I'm not doing that. But the initial design was to have them be right next to uh, Ballet Arkansas. Well, Ballet Arkansas, the rep has got an annex theater right next to where Ballet Arkansas is. Oh, really? Yeah, you should check that out. That's really cool. They do... Um, Real small, intimate black box. performances, black box uh, in the round type of um, <clears throat> oh, I love type that place. You know, it's twenty years ago when we used to have place. another mayor, what was his name? Daly. Daly. I sent him a letter when I bought the Taborian Hall on Ninth sure. Street, Jim and Daly. and I sent Jim Daly a letter and said, North Little Rock has got the art district. Can we be the theater and performance district? And he loved it because we have something like seven theaters. Mm-hmm. Between all the way up to Sixth Street, sure. Because or set, or maybe it was Ninth Street because you could do the children's theater. Yeah. So if you go from from Second Street all the way to Ninth Street, Little Rock has, I think, seven theaters. Well, I think it's a great idea to create a, a performing well, arts. Well, it sounds like it's happening. Area. Well, I'd, I'd love to see it, but I'd also like to see a visual arts uh, component of all that. Well, too. that always goes with it too. Sure. Um, so was signing the lease scary? Oh, absolutely. How long did you, well, I won't ask you how long you had to sign it, but I know you had to sign it. To me, that is, was one of the scariest things about the DeBorean Hall was signing the paper that said you're going to do this for so many years. Yeah, it scares the hell out of you. You know, you've committed to a certain amount of money. Uh, the other thing is a payroll, trying to meet a payroll every week. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like for you. I've got one employee, but it's... Are you punching a clock these days? Do you have to be at the <laughs> gallery all the time? When I moved Arkansas Flag and Banner out of my home and into a storefront, mm-hmm. it was a shock well absolutely and it's a shock for me and yes i'm there it feels like i'm there all the time but fortunately i did hire carrie uh, i call her carrie carolyn crocker oh i know um and fortunately i did hire her so i can occasionally get away i went to a wedding this last weekend and i'm going to i the saw that on facebook tomorrow, so, yeah go hog so you know i get 
a day off every once in a while, but there's very few days off, you know. But, you know, when you love what you do, it doesn't feel like it's work all the time. I know it's But you've only been cliche. doing it a year. I'm going to ask you that in five well, years. Okay. Yeah. So I'm here with my guest, Matt McLeod from the McLeod Fine Arts Gallery on Main Street in downtown Little Rock. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. If you've got questions for me or Matt, you can call us. Hold it, I'm fixing to read it. At 501 433 Zero zero eight eight, or you can. Tim's nodding. Very good, Carrie. Or you can email me questions with an S at upyourbusiness dot org. So pricing your work. Mm-hmm. Every artist I know mm-hmm. sells too cheap. <laughs> then you can tell I'm a business person. Uh-huh. I'm like that's too cheap. Uh-huh. I know how much paint costs. Uh-huh. I know how much time that took. Right. But artists never think their time's worth anything well and i know that was your problem in the beginning and well, you finally parsed over to the other side have i <laughs> i think so because your prices last night were right up there where they should have been well good i'm glad to hear that i still think i'm a bargain but you know there you go that's I, the entrepreneurial spirit well you know i have to tell you quite honestly people in little rock are a shop for a bargain and so that's part of it is that you have to understand what your market is you know willing to pay uh, but I think people do need to spend a little more uh, on, on really quality artwork. But it really, the, the reality for uh, pricing, that's what you're asking. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, there has to be a pragmatic side. I would, I t- when I, if I was to tell another artist, I would say, okay, look, you know, be, be ultimately pragmatic. Look at you know, what your materials really cost you. Look at the time that you're going to put in on it. And what's that, you know, if you put an hourly rate on that, what would that come up to? And then look at it as, it, how, you know, how many paintings am I selling a year? You know, and what does that mean? The business. And what do I need to make? And how do I cover my costs? Because the thing that breaks my heart is to see artists who are really talented who can't make a living. And you were mentioning part-time work, and that's part of it, too. You know, some people go back to, you know, wait tables or, you know, and I've done all that. I've done anything, everything. I think most artists don't have enough business sense. Mm -hmm. You and Pat Matthews, both of you are my friends, Mm -hmm. and you both have got some business background, and you understand an income statement. Right. And a balance sheet. Right. And it's not just, oh, I bought $10 worth of paint. I'm going to sell it for $20. Right. There's overhead. There's employees. There's advertising. I mean, they just, there's a lot that goes into it. Mm-hmm. And I think too many artists don't realize all that goes into it. Well, I think that most artists work on, I can't remember what's left or right side of their brain. Oh, I looked that up because the last time you and I had this conversation, okay. you, you, neither one of us knew. So they work on the one you don't think they'd work on. They work on the right side. Right side of their brain. And that's Supposedly. the creative side. And they want to stay there. It feels good to be in that part of your brain, actually. And so, you know, a lot of artists want to stay in the right side of their brain. And, um, and actually, that's good for me because, um, you know, they allow me to use my left side of my brain to help sell their work and, and handle a lot of those business things. I noticed at your gallery you had, you had probably your art was the least amount of art last night. Well, There was only two, I think, paintings of yours, and there were several, several. There were three or four artists there who yeah. had more paintings than you. Mm. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's, that's accurate. Um, you know, that I, would, I would address it this way, that I've been really fortunate this year. I've, I've done a lot of commissions, and I haven't done a lot of what I call spec work, which is just you know, creating something and putting it on the wall. And that's a real blessing for me. But, um, you know. And is it I, hard to come up with new ideas when you are just doing, no. when you're not doing commissions? No. No, I love it. I mean, you know, I, I, but my ideas, you know, I, I'm one of those artists that doesn't sit, sit and contemplate certain emotions and stuff like that. I'm much more um, interested in finding something that I see and that maybe you've seen and, and pulling it apart and putting it back together in an interesting way. So I, I have an unlimited source of inspiration. I mean, I, if I find anything, I, I'll try to look at it, recreate it, reframe it. And, and, just, and so I'm working on, you know, that level of visual interest and creativity but no i never run out of inspiration i mean i find stuff all the time but a lot of times what i do is i start my work in my camera so you know i'll walk around with my camera all the time finding interesting visual compositions and i'll start composing within the rectangle of that viewfinder and within the camera and i'm not a great photographer but but i start thinking in terms of composition and light and that's fun. That's really, really fun. You feel like you're an artist when you're walking around sort of kind of creating within your camera and thinking about ideas that you might turn into, into That's a great paintings. tip for artists. So what do you have? What, that's a great tip Thank you. for artists who are wanting to get started sure. or create. Sure. What else 
any other, do they have to go to school like you? What other suggestions do you think? I heard you say 10%, 90%, yeah. 90% work. Mm -hmm. But have you got any real advice for somebody who wants to do art and oh, get gosh. started? So do we have another couple of hours here? <laughs> <laughs> Just no. give us a couple of big pointers. Like how, if you were starting today, yeah. and you were going to start all over today, knowing mm -hmm. everything that you know, mm -hmm. would you start with your camera? Well, it's not that simple of an answer, uh, uh -huh. being because a lot of artists are very much interested in showing people and the figure. And so if you're that type of artist... What does that artist, mean, showing people the figure? Well, a lot of people, like my, my friend Kevin Cressy. Do you yeah, know oh yeah, I've got his. Okay, mm -hmm. he's very interested in um, sculpting the figure, people. Oh, I got you. Forms. Figure, yeah, people. People, okay. forms. And... If that's your thing, you need to go with your thing. You got to you know. take a lot of naked people. But what well, you do, there and you that's, go. That's and no wonder Kevin likes that. <laughs> 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 I wonder how his wife feels about yeah. that. I'm gonna talk to her. Yeah, she's amazingly Bridget? supportive of all that. Actually, she laughs about it too. I know. But you know, the thing is, what I would say is, embrace what you really love and, and and just run with it and i just happen to be someone who's always looking at landscapes i like people in landscapes things in landscapes but i'm always searching in that direction because that's what drives me and so if i was to you know talk to me the starting artist you know 15 16 years ago i'd say look what is it that you really feel like you need to say or that you really respond to embrace that completely and work your butt off for it and don't and don't be afraid to supplement your income in other ways, and but just keep working at it. That is some good advice. Just keep working at it. Thank you, Technician Tim, for a great hour. No problem. It was fun. Next week, our guest will be Jack Sundell, founder and head bottle washer at the Root Cafe. I'm not sure, but he may bring his beautiful wife, Corey, with him. And since they work together, that'd be nice to hear both their perspectives on opening and running a small business, not to mention the issues surrounding working together at the Root Cafe and then working together at home as they raise their families. I mean, do you keep that separate? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have a great entrepreneurial story and would like to share it, I'd love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info, too. Questions at upyourbusiness.org. And someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program's been about you, you're right, but it's also about me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next Friday at 2 p.m. on KABF Radio in Little Rock, Arkansas. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up Your Business with Carrie McCoy. To hear today's program again, or to hear the full unedited interview of Carrie's guest today, or if you want someone else to benefit from what you heard, jot this down. A podcast will be available within 48 hours at upyourbusiness.org or at flagandbanner.com. Again, that's upyourbusiness.org. Click on the tab labeled podcast. There you'll find today's segment with links to resources you heard discussed on this program. Carrie's goal to help you live the American dream.